In this lesson, we look at the DIO module. The DIO module provides a simple abstraction for discrete inputs and outputs. This discrete I.O. is sometimes referred to as digital I.O. and fortunately the DIO abbreviation works for that as well. These are the console commands for testing and debugging which we'll look at later. Here are the major interactions that the DIO module has with other modules and this is hardly worth showing because there's just one, the command module. And the interaction is because the DIO module has some console commands. So during startup, those commands are registered with the command module. And during operation, if someone enters a DIO command, then the uh, command module will call the command handler in the DIO. Now let's look at the DIO API in the header file. It takes quite a few parameters to describe discrete inputs and outputs, so you will see quite a few definitions in this file. What we want is an API design that can support multiple types of hardware, even though we only need to support STM32F401 for now. And we want that API to be common to different hardware types. In other words, the higher level code will be unaffected by changes in the hardware. We'll talk more about this in a bit. So as you can see here, I took a bunch of symbols like these and these that, that are from the LL library, and I created equivalent DIO symbols, and the mapping is not very creative. But the point is to, is to create isolation between the user and the LL library. So the user doesn't say LL GPIO pin 6, the user says DPIO pin 6. Then there are structures to um, define a input, this one, or an output. And these structures, the fields in these structures, are basically the fields needed to do the pin configuration. Although I did add two things. One is a name, which is handy for debugging. And the other is this invert uh, field. And the invert field is there because sometimes an input or output value has the opposite uh, polarity of what seems logical. So maybe you have a push button. And when you push the button, the input becomes zero. And that might seem wrong to you and confusing. So in cases like this, you can use this invert flag. Now here is the overall DIO configuration structure. And if you look at this, these two entries represent an array of input structures. And these two entries represent an array of output structures. So if we had to support a new MCU, the question would be whether we could do that with the same DIO module API. Well, we would need to look at all of these symbols we created, like these, and these structures, and we would have to see how well that fits in with the new MCU. Depending on how well it, it fits in, the API might stay the same or might require some changes. And I think we could live with some changes. The point is we made some effort to keep the API generic, but not a lot of effort. And this is in line with a principle in extreme programming that warns against spending a lot of time designing for the future. Oftentimes that future never happens and you wasted time and maybe made the code more complicated than it needed to be. I've seen that many times. So continuing on, here is the core APIs, those functions, and you'll notice this note here. Um, it's almost a warning. It's saying that the DIO module keeps a copy of the config pointer so that the DIO module can continue to access the data in the config structures as the system runs. The user of the DIO module has to be sure there will be no problem with that, and there's usually not. This issue is discussed in some detail in the lesson uh, for the command module. 
So after the core APIs, we see APIs that are used to actually get and set values from the discrete I.O. And one thing I wanted to point out, these APIs take indices uh, to identify the, the uh, input or output. And those indices are the indices into these arrays in the uh, DIO config structure. What you would do if you were using this is most likely do some hash defines or create some enums um, so that you could use a uh, symbolic names um, when, when using these functions and not raw integers. Now let's look at the implementation. I'm just going to show you a few things. One thing about this module is there is no state information. So in this sense, it's really simple. I just wanted to point out here is that config pointer that we talked about before. This is the information that's provided to the command module, mainly the, um, the console commands. And then here are the core API uh, functions, DIO init and DIO start. And what you can see is they make use of a lot of the LL, low-level library APIs. Here are the APIs that actually get and set values. And there again, they pretty much use the LL APIs. So continuing on down, here we find the uh, command handlers for the console commands. And that is it for the implementation. So here we are at the console, and I just wanted to show you the console support for DIO. So if we do a DIO question mark, you can see we have a status command, a get command, and a set command. Um, this is just the command that sets the uh, logging level. So the most useful of these, I think, is the DIO status, because it gives you the status of the inputs and the outputs. And there you can see them. Um, DIO get uh, takes a name. So I will do a get on button one. You can see it's zero. Now I'm going to cut and paste this so I could repeatedly execute it. And I'm going to hold the button down now. And you can see it's one. I'm going to let it go. And it's went back to zero. And uh, I think that's about it for the console. Now let's look at some possible enhancements to this module. One is to move all relevant hardware initialization from generated code to this module. I think this simplifies things and is in line with the goal of moving away from the IDE. Another enhancement is to support interrupts on discrete inputs. This is a feature of the MCU hardware and would be nice to support. So that's it for the DIO module. Thanks again for watching.